Well, good morning and welcome to the 24th meeting of the Economy, Now Energy and Fair Work Committee. Um, may I remind everyone to turn electrical devices off or to silent, please? And uh, first of all, may I welcome our new member, Angela Constance, and ask her to declare any relevant interests. Uh, thank you, convener. I have no relevant interest to declare, and my register of interest is there for everybody to see. Thank you. Item two on the agenda is a decision by the committee to take items four, five, and six in private. Are we agreed? Yes. Thank you. Now, today we're looking at European structural and investment funds as part of our inquiry. And uh, as part of that, I'd like to welcome Ivan McKee, who is the new Minister for Trade, Investment and Innovation. And also with him is David Anderson, who is the head of European Structural Funds State Aid Division of the Scottish Government. So welcome to both of you this morning. And I'll open or ask uh, Ivan McKee to make an opening statement to the committee at this stage before we move to questions. Thank you, convener, and good morning, committee. And um, it's my first appearance in front of the committee in my new role, and um, hopefully it'll be the first of many. Um, and thank you very much for the invitation to contribute to an inquiry on European structural and investment funds and for the provisional findings your work has already produced. The European Social Fund and the European Regional Development Fund programmes have provided significant funding to Scotland for over 40 years to promote economic development and cohesion. Going back to the 1970s, Scotland received funding for a wide range of activity, including, for example, road improvements in Ayrshire and new water supplies on the Scottish islands. Today, the EU aims of smart, sustainable and inclusive growth towards the Europe 2020 targets and the Scottish Government's ambitions of sustainable, inclusive growth are set in the national performance framework neatly align. The programme support a number of Scottish Government's priorities. Funds from ESF are used by Skills Development Scotland and the Scottish Funding Council towards the aim of a well-equipped workforce with 17,000 individuals receiving skills training. This is in addition to other programmes that are working to contribute to alleviating poverty and increasing social inclusion by providing support to 15,000 individuals, including low-income households, lone parents and those not in work. The ERDF programme supports investment in 16,000 SMEs to grow and create jobs and opportunities and is aiming to support 500 organisations to develop low-carbon processes and technologies to facilitate Scotland's transition towards a low-carbon economy. During May, when you took expert advice from a number of organisations, it was stated the programme support between 10 and 25 per cent of local authority economic development and employability spent. And I'm sure you'll agree with me that the significant contribution to economic development in Scotland cannot be underestimated. This is not, however, without its challenges. The programmes come with significant audit and compliance requirements. The European Commission have issued around 6,000 pages of rules via three regulations, eight implementing acts, nine delegating acts, and over 100 pieces of guidance. The Commission requires that all expenditure which is claimed complies with these rules, and failure to do so can result in serious penalties. We have experienced problems in the past where non-compliance has been identified, resulting in funding being reduced. The Scottish Government, as a responsible managing authority, works hard to support those applying for and in receipt of these funds by distilling the complexity and clarifying understanding around the compliance and audit process to avoid risk and maximise the positive outcomes this provides for Scotland. This is achieved by carrying out thorough checks, regular reviews of guidance and processes and always seeking opportunities to simplify the process where possible. And your provisional findings identified value in programmes that are based on funding being needs driven, based on good practice from the current and previous programmes and directed at people and places. The UK Government has also recognised the value and contribution these programmes have made and this is demonstrated in its commitment to replace these programmes with a shared prosperity fund. It has acknowledged that it will engage with us and counterparts in Wales and Northern Ireland and respect the devolution settlements. However, I have to tell you to date, there is no detail from the UK Government on how it intends to take this proposal forward. The EU exit was not Scotland's choice, but we will work with the UK Government to avoid and mitigate the worst effects for Scotland. This includes ensuring that repatriated pearls are transferred to the Scottish Parliament, along with a sustainable funding package and any proposed replacement for the ESF and ERDF programmes. 
The aims of the programmes and the distinctive characteristics, such as a longer time scale beyond a single year or even a parliamentary term, the recognition of regional development, particularly the Highlands and Islands, and the partnerships, including between government, public bodies and the third sector, remain a good starting point for future programmes. As you noted, we do not want a programme that is seen as rigidly bureaucratic, and we want to simplify the management of the programmes where possible, in line with public finance standards, to ensure that funding is spent appropriately and audited proportionately. By aligning the strengths of the programmes with Scottish policies and priorities, including the National Performance Framework, Economic Strategy and Enterprise and Skills Review, we need to strike a balance between compliance and complexity that will maximise the impact of future programmes for Scotland. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Um, thank you very much for that, Minister. Uh, you, you commented on this being something that's been ongoing for over 40 years, um, the ESIF, to promote uh, economic and social cohesion. Do you have specific examples that you can point to where this has helped to reduce economic and social disparities if we think of deprived areas in uh, Scotland where things are not improving? Can you think of specific examples where the SIF funds have yeah, I resulted think, I mean, in improvements as opposed to simply programmes delivered? Well, if you, I think if you, if you reflect back on the evidence you've had from um, representatives from Highlands and Islands, are very, very clear and very strongly made the point in your future sessions about the huge value that it made to the Highlands and Islands. And clearly, you mentioned that yourself, it's a specific area of Scotland that's received um, particular focus in terms of the way the programmes are delivered um, to the extent that match funding requirements are reduced and there's £150 million pounds has been put into the Highlands and Islands through this programme and hundreds of millions over previous programmes. Now, it's difficult to say what is the difference in terms of what would have happened anyway, um, but I think everybody, and the best example I say is for people that, that, that are from the Highlands and Islands that have come here and said very clearly the significant benefits it's made, made to the region. Um, another example, you want to talk about inequalities, the work on the Youth Employment Initiative, which we, we may come on to talk about later in terms of decommits. Um, you know, other programmes have been in place, but certainly the work that's been delivered by, um, by these programmes, we've seen Scotland's youth unemployment reduce significantly from 25% down to around 10% below the UK average and a significant amount of the focus of our programmes has been um, focused on reducing youth unemployment. So I think there's a couple of examples there where you can see regional and economic um, disparities have been reduced through the, the focus that uh, these programmes have brought to Scotland. Um, can they be directly related in that way, though? Well, as I said, all you can do is look at the, the structure of the programmes, the performance framework that's agreed with the European Union, the deliverables are part of that, the number of people and organisations that have been supported through the programmes, and I mentioned some of those in my opening speeches, um, the, uh, the, the tens of thousands of individuals have been supported directly and businesses additional to that, um, and recognise that those individuals and those businesses have benefited from that support. How that stacks up to the macro, as I say, is you, you're never sure what the counterfactual is, what the impact of other uh, interventions that, that, that the Scottish Government has taken in any event are, um, and, and what factors are, are pushing in the other direction and what would have happened anyway. But certainly you can, you can clearly point to the support it's given to individuals and organisations and the benefits it's made to them, and at a macro level, what it's done in terms of the, uh, the, 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 uh, the Highlands Islands and youth employment as a couple of specific examples. I've got a couple more... Um, examples here we can talk about. Um, if you, I mean, one of the things is around about connectivity and um, a specific example, state of the art video conference and cut suites in the University of the Highlands and Islands, which has made a huge difference to the connectivity and their ability to, uh, to, 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 to work together. Um, and there's also some numbers if you want to talk about the, um, for example, Scottish Enterprise around the Scottish Co-Investment Fund. And if you look at the data there, the additional net GVA added through to the 2025 period has been an estimated at £290 million. So a significant impact there on economic growth to the Scottish economy as a consequence of these programmes. Um, thank you. We'll now come to Jamie Halker Johnston, who may have further questions in this area. Thank you very much, Convener, and good morning to the Minister. Um, you rightly point out the importance of the Highlands and Islands, and um, the Highlands and Islands area makes up 20% of the funding across both, uh, both the funds. Um, you mentioned um, the individual figures there, but 
The figures uh, that I had here in terms of committed funding was, I think for the European Regional Development Fund was 51% so far committed, maybe slightly higher uh, now. And uh, for the European Social Fund, 33% uh, committed of the total package, which would eventually, if they were fully committed, come to around about 180 million on previous exchange rates. So what can you do, or what can the Scottish Government do to ensure that that um, uh, potential allocation is met and that the compliance is met and that um, the money available is, is fully utilised for the Highlands and Islands? Yeah, and thanks for the question. And this is an issue clearly that, that operates across the whole country, not just in the Highlands and Islands. We've got the, the challenge of how do you um, allocate the funds and deploy the funds com um, compliant with the audit requirements that I've, that I've talked about. Um, certainly in the early stages of the programme, I think it was recognised there was a slower take up, particularly in the Highlands and Islands. And um, I know that um, Keith Brown, who was the Cabinet Secretary, wrote back out to organisations, encouraged organisations to, to step up and become more engaged in the programme. Um, one of the specifics that's happened with regards to the Highlands and Islands is because of EU rules and because of the fact that the Highlands and Islands are a, a transition area, mm -hmm. um, distinct from the rest of Scotland, uh, we were able to relax the match funding requirements, um, and those are increased to 70% in terms of programmes or in terms of specific mm -hmm. activities, sometimes as high as 80% of the funding can come from the funds. So that's one specific we've done to try and encourage organisations and programmes to come forward and take part uh, and utilise these, these funds uh, as, as best as possible to support right. development in Highlands and Islands. So, so thank you for that um, for, thank you for that answer. And so would you be confident that that total allocation will be met or what, do you have a figure that you're working in a potential, um, um, potential commit, you know, allocation that will be met? I think it's very difficult to say at this stage, obviously, we're, we're several years out in the way the programme works. We'll maybe talk about this in more detail later. Mm -hmm. With N plus three is that you, you, you've got three years after you've committed the funds to, to utilise them. But given the, 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 the complexity of the audit requirements, again, I think we'll talk on, um, it's very difficult to predict, are we going to miss because somebody's not going to be complying with audit requirements at some point down the line, or are we going to have enough... Um, proposals and programmes coming forward to utilise the funds. But certainly the officials and the team and the managing authority are working very, very hard to push that. Um, and the signs at the moment are that like, I couldn't, I'd, I'd be very difficult to see we're going to utilise all of the funds. Um, but uh, certainly the vast majority will be deployed to support the development of the Highlands and Islands. Thank you. Thank you, Bailey. Pursue this slightly further, but but take it a bit wider. Um, and I always think it's instructive to learn from the past, so we avoid making similar mistakes in the future. So at the end of 2017, um, your expenditure targets weren't met, and something like 22 million euros, which I'm sure you'll agree is a substantial amount of money, was either lost or decommitted. Um, what have we learnt since then, and what do you think caused those problems that we will avoid in future? Um, you're absolutely correct. I mean, that was funding for the 2014 period with N plus three um, tripped out at the end of, t end of 2017. Of that 22 million euros, around 16 million euros was associated with the uh, southwest of Scotland youth employment initiative programmes. And as I mentioned um, earlier, the, uh, the significant reduction we've seen in the post-economic uh, crash period in youth unemployment is... E in some ways, you can see that's a success of the programmes and other initiatives, but what it has meant is that there's less places to spend that money. Um, so we've gone from a position where youth unemployment was around about 25% at the point where the programmes were being designed and the funds allocated sure. to that to a point where it's around about 10%, one of the lowest in the EU, the lowest in the UK. Um, I, so I, as that happens, it becomes obviously harder to find places to allocate exactly the money. And that but is the, the by you large will, significant, you will significant appreciate driver that the of the Scottish that Local Authority Economic Development mm -hmm. Group pointed to seven criticisms, um, not all of them related to the improvement in youth unemployment. So, for example, delays of up to a year for the Scottish Government to issue guidance, mm -hmm. um, you know, a wasted exercise in you know, looking at the cost models to be used that inevitably led nowhere. Um, do you intend to sharpen up on these issues mm -hmm. Um, rather than just point to one thing when clearly Well, I think it's important if you're going to, as you said, learn from the past and look at the problem of the 22 million, by far the lion's share of that, the 16 million was around about the youth employment initiative. So if you're going to try and fix that problem, 
then you've got to look at what is by far the biggest cause of it, and, and that's why it's important, I think, we talk about that. In terms of the other issues you've mentioned, the delay in terms of the programme, the, 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 the programmes of 28. 14 to 2020 program um, so it was approved at the end of 20 the end of 20 December 2013 by the European Union um, the European Commission the Scottish government then worked with the rest of the UK because the UK is a member state to put partnership agreement together that, that got agreed in the, towards the end of uh, of 2014 uh, and then the Scottish government out at the start of 2015 to uh, to call for programs for the um, to, to take part in the funds. Um, and as I said earlier, there was a, a slow initial take-up on that and we had to go back out and in some cases review the match funding requirements in order for people to uh, encourage more people to come forward. So then the initial delay, if you like, was part of that pulling together that partner or getting that partnership agreement with the rest of the UK in place, which happened in the latter part of 20, 2014. Specifically on the, the, the unit costs you mentioned, um, that feeds into the simplification agenda, which I think is something you might also want to talk about later. Um, the, the, the issue there, just to, to, to talk through that in a bit more detail, is that moving away from a situation where you're having to approve individual receipts and, and, and timesheets, etc., to a position where you can say that the, the, the cost of an individual, we, we can allocate the, their time and understand the cost per hour for, for that individual and, 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 and allocate funds on that basis, which clearly makes the whole process and audit requirement much simpler. So work was put in at the start of the 2014-20 programme to... Um, to work to deliver that and unit costs um, is put in place for parts of the programme spent, not, not across all of it, not, uh, not across parts of it and other issues, for example, the flat cost system whereby you take the individual's cost and add on a percentage uplift for administration and, and, and travel costs, etc. on top of that were also put in place. So I think between those two, the programme has been simplified. So I don't think it's fair to say that that work was wasted because I mean, I'm going to be asked about simplification and reducing bureaucracy, and that is the work that went in place to make sure that that happened to some extent okay, at the start I think, of the programme. I think I was trying to reflect the view of the Scottish Local Authority Economic Development Group um, rather than, than my own, but, but I take what the Minister says. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell me what the current allocation is for the programme? Four hundred and twenty million committed. Was that today? Okay. And what's your expectation of um, spend? Yeah. I appreciate it's difficult to predict, but you will have internal processes mm -hmm. where you know how much your intent it, it, it is the intention to spend. And I'm interested in knowing how those internal processes that, work and what the figures are. That's fine. We clearly have spoken about the, the, the 22 million decommit we're aware yep. of just now. There's clearly also an issue, um, and I'll ask David Anderson to talk to us in a minute, around about exchange rates, which is important to recognise because the programmes are put in place where an exchange, I think, of 125, and now we're exactly where we are today, but 111, 112. So that clearly makes a difference because all the programmes from the EU side are, are funded Euros. in Euros. Yeah. So that does make a difference in terms of the amount of pounds we've got available to spend. But I'll ask David Anderson to talk through the details of the numbers as where we are up to today. Uh, thank you, Mr. And uh, Ms. Bailey, as it as Minister said earlier, it is still our intention and planning to get all of the funds allocated throughout the life as, as far as we can. So we are still working on getting it, all the money committed. Um, and as the Minister says, quite what that number is depends on the exchange rates and any further decommitments that may become necessary. But we have there are two things working in our favour in that basis. One, we have been working uh, with the Scottish Local Authority Economic Development Directors uh, and with other stakeholders to be absolutely clear with them how much money is still there and how much money they want. So going through the round two. So it's a case of, okay, bring forward your idea. So we're having that good dialogue. The other thing um, is that where we identify that we might have shortfalls in terms of take-up is actually talking with other partners to see where else we might use to spend the money. So we have a couple of discussions ongoing, perhaps with some health colleagues, with universities and with one or two others, to try and seek to make sure that we use it, obviously within the rules that are set, but to try and make sure everything there. And the, the final point to say is that the change in the UK uh, HMT guarantee, which has changed in July, that meant prior to the, um, that point, all the funds, the funds that were 
committed by the date of Brexit were guaranteed, that date has now shifted out to the end of 2020. Um, clearly, we don't want to wait that long to commit the funds to mm -hmm. such an, if we were to crash out of Europe, but it does give a little more elbow room to commit final funding. Okay, thank you for that. One final question. Um, it, Scottish Government's response to SCVO criticism um, would, would be welcome, and let me quote from them directly. Many aspects of Scottish Government work very well, but management of the European Structural and Investment Funds is not part of this. Do you agree with their view, and what action are you going to take to improve things as the new minister? Um, no, I don't, I don't agree with, with, with everything they said. I mean, there are one or two things that I think we've, we've taken on board and we're going to go and, go and look at. Um, but I think they made a number, a number of comments. Um, a lot of that was round about the, um, the, the bureaucracy, round about the process need for, for simplification. And I think I have to point to what the statements I made in opening remarks were, were existing <coughs> under a very onerous audit requirement. I mean, there's 6,000 pages in terms of the, the EU requirements. Officials reduced that down to these two handy, simple documents for, uh, for organisations to, uh, to work with. But clearly, there's um, because things change from one programme to the next, the requirements, the EU requirements under the 2014-20 programme are different to what they were under the 2007-2013 programme. I think there's perhaps been some misunderstandings around about what the new rules were, people working on the old rules. There's been issues, and I've got examples of, of where all manner of things have happened that have led to, um, to audit problems um, and things that seem very simple and straightforward, um, but people not keeping records, not keeping timesheets, um, not uh, <coughs> Um, recording building costs correctly, not recording staff costs correctly. There's been a whole number of detailed issues there that, that have led um, in the end up to, uh, to, um, to, to, to issues with the funding we called down from the European Union as a consequence. And you'll be aware in the, the previous programmes, 2007-2013 programmes, I think at 1.3 of the four programmes are under suspension because of audit non-compliances. So this is a, a serious issue that needs to be dealt with properly. Um, so understand um, SVO's comments round about that, um, but the, the processes that are there need to be rigorous and robust and, and quite bureaucratic, I'm afraid, in some senses, to, uh, to ensure that we are, we are compliant with the, with the European Commission requirements. There are some issues, comments they made around about match funding, which, uh, which we do take on board, I think, in terms of uh, match funding for third sector organisations. Very often the Scottish Government is funding that. Um, so effectively, it becomes a 100% grant to third sector organisations, but that's not the case in, in, in all cases. And I do take on board the point they made about um, lead partners not always stepping in to uh, put match funding in place the way it was expected. Um, but it's also important to recognise that the, um, the, the SCVO chief exec is actually a member of the, the Joint Programme Monitoring Committee, so I mean they have had opportunity through the process to make the, the, their comments made as part of the ongoing process, and they have been listened to as part of that. So, But what I will do um, in my new role as Minister is undertake to meet with the SCVO as part of our um, uh, efforts to... Um, and I think we'll come on and talk about this later to design what the future might look like, notwithstanding where we are with Brexit and the uncertainty around the Share Prosperity Fund. But I'll undertake to meet with them and other stakeholders as we attempt to, uh, to design the future. Thank you, Convener. Um, may I just follow up on that? Is that not just basic stuff, keeping records of staff costs, things like that? I mean, that's not really that complicated, is it? Um, if that's what's causing audit trail problems, I mean, surely that shouldn't be arising. Well, I think when you're working on something as um, as broad with as many organisations and, and as much money and as many instances of claims, etc., as we're talking about here, you're always going to get a percentage that's problematic. Um, and they say that is the requirements. We exist under pretty onerous, and the, 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 the EC will bring an auditors to work through and double check what the officials in the Scottish Government are doing. So it's important we're on top of that. But I think, in, in, I mean, you task the organisations themselves that. But I think in any situation where you've got very many transactions going on, a percentage are going to be non compliant. That's why it's very important that we're rigorous about the audit requirements, we produce the guidance so that organisations understand what's there, produce monthly e-bulletins to keep organisations up to date, we work directly with organisations um, as best we can to make sure they're aware of what the requirements are and feedback any audit non-compliances in time so they've got the opportunity to fix those. 
Angela Constance. Uh, thanks very much, Good morning, Minister. Good morning. I want to uh, pick up some of the concerns uh, that have been raised by uh, Slade. Uh, I note that the Minister in his opening remarks uh, pointed to the 6,000 pages of rules uh, and the 100 pages of guidance and you reiterated uh, the Scottish Government's role to uh, distill the complexity of those rules and guidance with a view uh, to reducing risk. But as you've heard from other members, you'll also be aware and aware from the evidence of committee uh, of criticism from stakeholders about the level of inflexibility and bureaucracy. And specifically, uh, Slade uh, gave a long list of reasons why it can be uh, difficult to translate commitments into expenditure. And one of them was elongated Scottish Government uh, appraisal and assessment procedures. And I just wondered if the Minister could say more about uh, how you can ensure that Scottish Government practice isn't adding uh, to uh, an, a, a, an already very complicated process? Well, I, mean, I think without getting into a huge amount of detail on specifics, I think it's, um, it's fair to say that we understand the simplification agenda very well and it's at the forefront of our minds. And I gave examples earlier as to where we'd look for areas where we could reduce complexity in the claims process by looking at unit costs and flat costs and, and so on and so forth. Um, the, um, and I think the finest example, as I said before, we take the 6,000 pages and we reduce it into about 100 pages. Um, and then we work very closely with organisations to make sure they understand um, what the requirements are and work through that process with them as, as best we can. But, it, it, it's, I mean, the, 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 the bureaucracy and audit requirements, as I said, is not something that the managing authority in the Scottish Government has, has put in place. That is the reality of what we're, we're working under in terms of the EC rules. And those rules are, are, are robustly um, um, interpreted and, and implemented. And the consequences, as I said, of, of, of not complying are pretty significant. So I, I can understand where organisations on the outside looking in would see, would see what they see. But I think I've demonstrated that the Scottish Government and its intent and what it's done in terms of designing the, the, the claims process in terms of cost management and in the way it's, it's, it's working hard to simplify and make accessible the, 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 the complex rules around about this process are very much committed and understand the issues and want to make this as simple as possible for organisations to participate. Because at the end of the day, we want to move the funds into these organisations and get the benefit from Scotland for it. It's in nobody's interest to make the system more complicated or more cumbersome or more difficult or the funds more difficult to access than it needs to be. Mm -hmm. But you're confident that current processes and procedures are not adding complexity or are you saying that where that exists you'll endeavour to uh, reduce complexity, particularly looking to the future. Absolutely, absolutely, and that's exactly what, what I'm saying. And I think I'll ask uh, David Anderson to maybe give a bit more detail on the specifics. When we get a, an, a, an application for funding, we have to make sure that it fits the programme, and we have to then fit, submit it to a managing authority approval panel. That has a certain number of checks. There is a standard template form that allows people to fill in the data um, for who want the money we then check that that complies. We do that as quickly as we can uh, within the rights. We often have a dialogue backwards and forwards with the stakeholder to make sure that both what the numbers are set out are correct, what the it's delivering is fits, uh, and that they actually be clear. Because it's on the basis of that that we make a formal commitment of grant funding between Scottish ministers and the actual person being funded. So we have to be sure what we're buying, if you will. So we make that point as quickly as possible. In previous programmes, we had to submit that to a panel that met quite infrequently. That panel now meets on a six-weekly cycle, and therefore there should be very little delay, if any, um, between getting an application. When it's ready to be put to, appraisal, to approval, we can take it there as quickly as possible. And we do take some out of sync, just to make sure that we don't hold people up. We had one recently uh, where Highlands Science Enterprise were interested. The other uh, point is that we... Um, 
within all of this, we actually are talking with Slade themselves. In fact, one of my team leaders is giving a presentation to the Slade uh, on Friday of this week in the Lighthouse, setting out, sharing the information. Is, Look, this is the amount of money, this is how much we're going to do. So one of the other ways of breaking down any delays is having that open dialogue, and we are having a good and positive dialogue with them. So we are helping where we can to make this thing as slick as possible. Uh, convener, one final question, uh, if I may. The, the Minister's commitment to meet with SCVO, uh, I'm sure, is very welcome, as is his uh, commitment today to uh, take on board any concerns. Uh, one of the things that SCVO raised that actually work well uh, was uh, within the Third Sector Division in Scottish Government in terms of the 100% um, eligibility costs um, being met and indeed uh, the, the, the match funding. Um, I just wondered uh, if the Minister has any initial thoughts uh, on how he will pursue uh, that approach, uh, given that that will take, um, that won't just be for uh, his department, that will be for departments across the Scottish Government. In terms of match funding, yeah. In terms of increasing um, the Scottish Government's uh, ability to match fund? Yeah, I think just in general point about match funding, I'll make, and I'll ask David Anderson to talk about specifics on, on that, uh, the, the, that, the, that, that detail. Um, the, uh, I mean, clearly you've got a range of organisations that are applying for funding. Um, in some cases, they're perfectly capable of match funding that, and that's to be encouraged, eh, because it brings more money into play and, and significantly increase. If you look at the total number that's, that's, that's spent through these programmes, it's obviously significantly more than the money that comes from the, the, the EC as a consequence of, of match funding. It also demonstrates commitment from organisations and makes them, I would say, more committed to deliver um, and, and make sure they've, they've thought through because they're putting their own money, if you like, on the table to support the programme. So I think there's very much a place for match funding, but we do recognise in some cases there isn't a place for it because of the types of organisations typically in the third sector we're, we're working with. Um, so I think that mix is important. But I'll let uh, David Anderson talk about the details of that. The point you make and the point that SCVO make about the third sector fund is it was a choice by the third sector division to put effectively Scottish government money to match the European money to make that effectively a grant situation. Um, that, is a, that is the exception rather than the norm. If you think about the total value of the, the programmes, which is somewhere around 900 million euros, by having match funding brought into it, it means the overall investment in Scotland in these programmes is somewhere just under two billion, it's about 1.9 billion. So if we were to match fund everything at source, then we wouldn't lever in as much opportunity than if we were to seek match funding from those applying for the money. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dean Locker. Uh, thank you, Convener, and uh, good morning, Minister. Just wanted to follow up on the point about match funding requirements and get a, a further and a wider view of the, the benefits and challenges you have experienced in terms of match funding requirements. Is there uh, occasions where the match funding requirements have been too rigid and investments have been prevented, or is there sufficient flexibility in the system that you can uh, tweak the requirements as and when required? Um, well, th th a couple of points there. First of all, there are EU requirements round about the level of match funding um, that we need to adhere to, and um, those are, as I already said, specifically the Highlands and Islands because it is a transition area. There's, um, those, uh, those percentages are relaxed, so we can go up as high as 70, and in specific instances, 80 per cent, but in general, 50 per cent is where we need to be by, uh, based on the, the EC requirements. Um, so we're working within that that context. Um, I think the example on the Highlands and Islands where we did relax because we were able to within those rules to um, because we saw early on that there was a, sh a shortage of programmes coming forward, um, and that stimulated more more programmes coming forward. I think that, that demonstrated that that's been successful. I think the specific example of the third sector organisations where we understand the match funding thing as a challenge, we've worked hard to um, to do that. Um, we see every, has there never been a case where somebody has been present, prevented from participating? Because of match funding, there will be examples of that, I'm sure. But in general, we work hard to mitigate that within the rules as best we can. I don't know if David Anders maybe put some more detail on that. The, the, the one example I'd point to is Transport Scotland. Transport Scotland have put out a, a call for um, proposals in the Highlands and Islands with an intervention rate of 70%. Uh, 
that didn't, there were no, there were no takers. Uh, we were able to up that uh, percentage intervention rate, uh, and we now have some takers on those programs. So yes, we are, we do have flexibility, and yes, we do change um, intervention rates in the programs to respond to those demands. There was also, uh, we responded through the midterm review when we looked at the demand overall and made the case to the EU, because again, as the Minister said, the total uh, match funding percentages are, we have to agree with the EU, we can't just do what we like, um, we have to meet an average, but they were persuaded to allow us that flexibility to go higher, such that we could ensure that the actual funds were taken up the point that Ms Bailey was making. Okay, thank you. Colin Beatty. You know, Minister, you've made reference to the UK Shared Prosperity Fund. How much do we actually know about how this fund is going to operate? Has, has, are, there, are there guidelines in place already? or um, There's very little in place. Um, I think it's only within the last two or three weeks that there's been any official meeting on it. What we have is a, a UK government, well, Tory um, party manifesto commitment that they would put a fund in place to, uh, to replace the lost EU funds. Um, and then there was a statement in July of this year from a UK government minister that um, that said yeah the fund would be in place and um, they it would um, be aligned with the the objective and the four challenges of the UK government's industrial strategy and that they would in, in their words respect the devolution settlement engage with the devolved administrations on the design of it that in reality is pretty much as far as we've we've got i mean david anderson might say a wee bit more about where officials are in terms of the very latest discussions but at the moment it's very very unclear um where that uh, what that fund will look like um how it will be deployed how much funding will come to scotland as a consequence where the decisions will be made will they be made at uk level or will it all be devolved Scottish level, um, how much of the, 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 the EU's requirements will be will be mirrored. Um, so there are very many unknowns and clearly we're running out of time. The UK government's moving forward to a consultation process, which we thought would have happened by now, but it's going to be happening, we believe, later this year um, to, uh, to seek views on that. Um, our expectation, our hope very much, is that we would, would have a, a sit-down discussions with the UK government around uh, where the devolved um, uh, requirements would fit into that, that, that programme going forward and we wouldn't be treated as just a, a consultee filling in an online form. So that's very much our hope. And certainly I met with Lord Henley, who's the Minister responsible, um, last month and, uh, and raised these points with him. But as I say, very unclear at the moment um, and time is, is running on. Uh, David wants to say some more on that. There's not a great deal more to say, I'm afraid, but um, we have, as officials, met with colleagues. We've been pressing uh, ever since the May 2017 manifesto commitment was made. Uh, we have a, a group that meets for, f across the UK uh, for the managing authorities. And we, when this was first announced, we said, well, what is it going to be? Um, we have had no detail on that, and we've been pressing to get that detail. And when I say that, that means both Wales, Northern Ireland and ourselves. And it would be said a number of different parts of England as well, because they've made clear that it's going to be at a regional level that the fund will be allocated. So that process is now beginning. Uh, I have met with officials uh, from um, the UK government, and I know that in the last week those same officials have met with representatives of Northern Ireland and uh, Wales officials. But the detail uh, is still to come what at the moment I think they're very much looking to say is the consultation what what do people need and this is where I think one of the pieces of work that we've got in train internally is to actually take not only the results of you know, your own investigation here but also what the stakeholders have been saying to work out what it is that Scotland's ask is such that we can put the case to the UK government to say well this is what we want. Is there a, is there a commitment from the UK government to maintain the present level of uh, funding for a specific period beyond Brexit, or don't we know? There is a, there's two scenarios. There's a no deal scenario, in which case there is a, a guarantee we understand in place that we step in to fill the funding gap to the end of the 2020 programme, which effectively runs through to 2023 with the N plus three 
process um, in the eventuality that there is a deal, then clearly the existing programme runs through with EU funding uh, as planned, and it's a programme beyond that, the 2020 onwards programme, um, 2021 onwards programme. Um, in terms of the specific commitments round about the level of funding, my understanding is that there's, there's nothing been given there, so that is one of the one of the unknowns, and certainly our ask or requirement would be very strongly that Scotland would need to receive at least the same level of funding as we, we would have expected from the equivalent um, the equivalent EU programme going forward. I don't know if you want to add any more on that. Yeah. Yeah. Trying to look at this positively, um, creating a new fund and new funding mechanisms and so on is perhaps an opportunity to improve on what's there. What would you think should be the guiding principles of this new fund? Well, it's, it's a great question, and I think that um, I'm going to take a step back from that and say that what we are keen to do, what I'm keen to do in my new role, is to engage with stakeholders. I think the work that the committee has done so far and the, the eight points you've raised in terms of where you would see the fund going are very helpful. I think the evidence you've taken from stakeholders has, has, has been very helpful as well. Um, and I would want to continue that process, engage with stakeholders and understand um, what their requirements are and some of the points that have come up, come up this morning. Um, I think it's, it's clear that um, we would want the, uh, and also the UK government's indicated that the fund's going to be built on their industrial strategy, so we're, we're kind of constrained by, by that. Um, but certainly, I think as far as as far as we're concerned, the the principle that underpins the EU funds of, of cohesion and social inclusion is hugely important. The um, the, the four eyes, if you like, of, of the Scottish government's economic policy are critically part of that innovation, internationalisation, um, um, investment, and inclusive growth are clearly very much underpin that, and it would be very much lined up to the measures in the national performance framework so that everything is coherent across the whole of government approach in Scotland. Um, you've then got questions around about how do you balance, I mean, and, and this is a whole series of balances, it's balanced between uh, how much flexibility you want um, versus how much stability you want. People like stability, but they also want flexibility to change things when circumstances change. How much does it need to be uh, coherent strategically and off Scotland level, but how much do you want to devolve regionally to be able to um, allow at regional level different um, choices to be made, but, but still being strategically coherent? Um, and what we've already talked about, the audit requirements, how strict do you need to be on that to ensure good use of public funds without being too bureaucratic um, in terms of uh, in terms of the process. So there's a whole number of trade-offs there, um, and I think it's important that we engage in that space to to understand the best place, the best way to go in terms of the direction as we move forward to to, to, to design, or at least to put forward our, our view on what a, a, a program for Scotland would look like going forward. Could you expand maybe on some of the headline points you made there and? give an indication of what you think the big societal challenges that any future fund should be tackling? Um, well, I think that, um, as I say, we're, we're going to be constrained by what's coming forward from the UK government in terms of the industrial strategy. So we kind of start with that, and that identifies certain themes around about age and society, around about mobility, around about low carbon, etc. Um, and broadly, we wouldn't disagree with those, I would, I would, I would say that, that kind of makes sense in the, the Scottish context as well. Um, so I think is it, we would probably st we would have to start from that basis and then we'd build on that depending on the feedback we get from stakeholders. But running across that, as I say, is the, the requirement for social inclusion, inclusive growth and cohesion, which is, which is usually important. So anything we do has to make sure that least developed regions in Scotland are, are, are invested in to bring them up to, uh, to the standard we want, that um, people that are furthest from the labour market, for example, are continuing to be brought brought into the labour market and upskilled. Um, so I think those principles are, are very central to what we would want to see. Now, so you've already said that uh, your starting point in terms of uh, fund allocation for Scotland is that uh, Scotland should receive no less than it is now. Having said that, do you believe that there is a formula which could be put in place which should be adopted for the allocation of funds across the UK? Um, 
No. <laughs> in terms of the rest of the UK, frankly, that's not a, a, a space that we would want to want to, to comment on. I know that within England there are, and I heard your earlier evidence, there are quite wide variations between different regions of England, if you like, in terms of the amount of funding they get. Um, but in terms of the split across the four nations, yet obviously we've got a view on that, which is, as I said, that Scotland would want to, um, would want, would require to maintain the same level of funding at least as we do at the moment and build on that going forward. Um, because there are specific requirements with, with the Highlands and Islands is only one of three transition areas across the whole of the, the UK. Um, so, and, and, and Scotland historically has enjoyed higher funding, the Highlands Islands in particular. So it's important that, that that's built in. So to answer your question, very keen, as I said, or to, to, to very strongly push the argument that Scottish funding would have to be at least the same level in, in any division between the four nations of the UK would have to take that into account. But in terms of the, the specifics across how the rest of the UK would manage their funding at a lower level, then that's not something I'd want to... I guess initially comment. keeping the funding at the same level is fair in terms of the situation we find ourselves in now. Going forward, uh, presumably there should be some formula in place to replace the one that's used by the EU. And the UK government should adopt some formula to be able to continue that allocation and build on it because, you know... I think it's about eight hundred and seventy-one million pounds we get allocated mm -hmm. have been allocated over the, over the past few years, and obviously we want to draw a line under that, but we don't want it to stay there. It sh it should move. How do we make that happen? That, that, that's if, if I may answer that one. The in the discussions with the UK, there is no formula that's been agreed. What is interesting when you look at the EU budget for the 2021-2027 period is that there is a pressure on the entire EU budget. And therefore, if we were to stay in Europe, there is a question mark as to what our allocation would be. Because again, like all of these things, we're pitching to say we want to do these things and therefore we need this much money. So the point you make, I think, is absolutely right. There is, There will need to be a discussion with colleagues as to how this overall fund, because at the moment there is no figure attached to the Shared Prosperity Fund, what is the right level and how should it be divided up? As the Minister already touched on, we benefit disproportionately if you were to take on a population basis the funding because of the needs of the Highlands and Islands. Mm -hmm. The other point is also that it is unclear entirely as to what the fund will cover. For instance, um, we understand it will cover the Marine and Fisheries Fund. Now, Scotland actually achieve, receives almost 50% of that because of the way that the fund is divided up. So we, dis we get a disproportionate, if you were to divide by the four nations, proportion of that fund. So there is a bit of mixing to be done to work out what it is we want to do with it, how much money we need to then do, to have to do that, and then argue our case very strongly. Um, John Mason. Uh, thanks very much, Convener. Um, I mean, I suppose following on from that, and I do accept that there's a lot of uncertainty in all of this, so in one sense, I suppose at one extreme, the UK could just put down a very rigid system and we would have no flexibility at all. But assuming we do have a fair bit of flexibility and assuming we have, say, roughly the same amount of money that we've had, how would you see that being allocated across Scotland? I, I mean, there's been some criticism that maybe we've only got two sections of Scotland at the moment. We've got the Highlands and Islands, we've got Scottish Enterprise area, will become three, obviously. Or should it be more subdivided down to more of a kind of council or a regional level? Have you any thoughts around that side? Well, I mean, if you look historically in terms of where these <coughs> programmes have been back in, in previous rounds, um, back around back uh, two or three um, cycles ago, there were like, up to five different areas within Scotland in terms of programmes, and that's gradually been reduced over time. And as you've heard in your other evidence, that's something that's been happening in other similar countries to Scotland, Scandinavian countries, etc., as well, over that period of time, as the funds come into more developed countries is reduced, uh, to reduce administration, etc., the number of programmes have reduced. So we're now in a, a situation in this, uh, in this cycle where there's, there's effectively one Scotland-wide programme but with some um, recognition and, and specific funding within that for the Highlands and Islands. Um, I think it comes back to the, the point I was making earlier, and in all of these decisions around about trade-offs, 
what do, we, what do we think makes the most sense and where do we want to be on that spectrum? And it's between having something that's coherent strategically and all Scotland level where we can direct maximum resources to fix the problems we identify, be that youth uh, unemployment is obviously one where it's been really successful and others as well. Um, and lined up with the national performance framework and lined up with the economic strategy, that, that's clearly important, but also to get the right balance where decisions can be made made at a local level. So, um, and clearly the more you, you devolve the administration of that, the more complex the bureaucracy and the administrative burden and the cost of that becomes. So that's part of the balance as well. Um, Having said that, it's clearly there are different requirements in different parts of Scotland, and that's something we'd have to take on board. So I think we're, we're open, and it, it, me coming in new to this job, it's a good opportunity just at the right time to be able to take uh, some views on that and to reflect on that, um, and very much keen to engage with, with stakeholders to take their views on it and um, to make sure we get that balance right going forward within the constraints of the Shared Prosperity Fund and as you rightly said, we, we might find it. a room for manoeuvre there. Yeah. Could be severely limited in any event. Well, I accept that. I mean, assuming we've got more room for manoeuvre, and then presumably we could be restrained. But, I mean, presumably over time, if the Highlands and Islands, and I think there's some evidence that they have kind of come closer to the Scottish average, and that has been, in my opinion, thanks to a lot of this extra funding. So that's been a success. So then, you know, wh where are the other needs? Mm. And, I mean, um, Mr Beaton and myself are on the cross-party group for industrial communities, mm. and there's a focus on, for example, the ex-mining areas, yeah. which still, I think, in Fife and Ayrshire particularly, you know, still have particular challenges. Now, that might be quite local, mm -hmm. either within a council or within a group of councils in Ayrshire, um, but is that the kind of thing where we could be targeting, you know, a relatively small area which has real need? It could well be, and, I think it, and it depends on... Uh, the other way to look at that is to say perhaps you've got a fund for post-industrial communities, for example, I'm not saying we would, but that then allows you to, tackle, to, to focus up much more specifically on programmes to communities rather than within any given council area, there's going to be a mixture of, of less well-off and, and more well-off areas. So um, if you want to target very specifically on a specific um type of challenge, you, you, it might be better that you do that by the, the way you design the programme and the interventions rather than the way you do it, do it regionally. Um, and it's even within the Highlands and Islands, there's, there's quite wide discrepancies between um, Inverness, for example, and some of the more outlying areas in terms of the challenges they face and the support they need. So um, you, you, you can be quite, come quite local in that sense, and we need to look at that in the round. And David Anderson, come contribute to this as well. I, I'm just going to make, bring out the point you just make, uh, Mr. Mason. It's that point about could we target smaller areas. That is perhaps an opportunity going forward. At the moment, the only fund that is targeted at a specific area of Scotland is a Youth Employment Initiative Fund, which is in the southwest. Otherwise, all the funds span either the Highlands and Islands or the rest of Scotland or the whole of Scotland. We don't have the flexibility to target very specific areas in because of the EC rules. So that is an opportunity, perhaps, from the fund going forward if we wanted to target the Ayrshire's particularly, say, in your example, that we maybe should be arguing for that flexibility to allow us to do so. Mm -hmm. OK, thanks so much. And John Constance. Uh, following on from uh, Mr Mason's point uh, about uh, economic development, a, a more, more local point, I wondered um, if the Minister is thinking about how any future successor programme could meaningfully link with the local governance review, <coughs> given mm. that the government's economic strategy is uh, increasing its regional focus, and also given the importance of meaningful uh, partnership work with stakeholders, whether that's the community sector, social enterprises, third sector, or indeed local government? No, it's a good point, um, and uh, it's something that I'll certainly pick up on to to, to have a look at the, the local governance review and see how this could uh, how this could align with it. Um, as I say, I mean, notwithstanding the fact that we don't know what we're going to be in, in able to do in in in, in, in the future, um, it does give us scope to perhaps look more broadly at how we line up with this. Clearly, it also plays into the regional 
economic development agenda and um, with the regional economic partnerships and what we're doing with city deals and uh, city region deals etc so there's a number of moving parts there um, and I think it's important that we, we, we take the time and, and have a look and see how this could all be all be lined up to best effect to deliver the overarching uh, objectives that we've got thank you Andy Whiteman thank you very much convener um, welcome uh, minister um, as I understand it, the government doesn't really have a regional economic development strategy as, as such, but it's got uh, a regional development agency and soon to have another one in the south. It's got uh, growth deals that it's promoting. Um, it's got a national planning framework. Apart from the resources that potentially could come from a shared prosperity fund, how do you see such a fund um, tying in with existing economic policy levers, the ones I've outlined? Uh, well, I think this gives us the opportunity to do that. I mean, at the end of the day, it all comes back to what are the overarching sub strategic objectives, what we're, uh, in terms of the four eyes, what we're measuring in terms of the national performance framework, and then in terms of regional development, as you rightly say, we've got Highlands and, and Islands Enterprise that, that's got a clear focus on developing um, economic development and, uh, and community cohesion in Highlands and Islands, and the New South of Scotland Agency, which is... Uh, which is taking forward similar programme in the south of Scotland. We've got the city region deals, which have put clear focus on local authorities and groups of local authorities to do uh, to bring forward programmes that make sense for their economic development in their specific areas. So there's a number of things obviously happening, as you rightly say, at different levels. Um, and as I said to Angela Constance, I think this is an opportunity for us to look at, at this point in time, what... Uh, what we want the programmes to do going forward as part of the Ship Prosperity Fund and how it can best fit in with those. So I think we're at the, the early stages of that. I'm not coming here with the answers as to how we're doing that, but very conscious of the fact that that is a piece of work that we need to uh, to take forward as government and me and my new role to engage with stakeholders to, uh, to, to, to figure out how best to do that. So can I just elaborate that a little bit more? Because in, in our inquiry on um, growth deals, um, or was that another committee I sat on? I can't remember. Um, uh, another committee. <laughs> um, there was a sense in which um, when pots of money became available, in that instance through growth deals, that people kind of just grabbed projects off the shelf that had been gathering dust or quickly put together propositions. Um, and there wasn't a lot of kind of strategic thinking underpinning some, some um, of the projects that were fed into that. Given that historically this has been a, a pot of money into which people have bid, um, I certainly get the sense that some of the projects that have been funded um, through these funds um, have uh, had their genesis uh, through similar initiatives, things being taken off shelves, um, a, a bit of ad hocery. My key question is you do have a range now of policies in place trying to take a more strategic approach um, how much flexibility will you need to ensure that any new shared prosperity fund that comes to Scotland can properly fit in with existing plans and strategies and not just be a pot of money that people bid into in a rather ad hoc fashion? Um, yeah, well, I think, to, I mean, to some extent, this plays back to the earlier um, answer I gave to, to John Mason, which is that um, if you want to have a coherent strategic perspective on this at an all-Scotland level, then you need to have some structure around about what kinds of programmes are going to be um, accessing those funds and, and, and going through a process to check that, 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 that they're coherent and, and, and feed into that over, overarching strategy and those objectives. So I think that that kind of, I understand that, but I think that's the reason why you, you wouldn't be able to, there's a limit to how much you can devolve. There needs to be an, over, an overarching strategic perspective on that uh, a Scottish level, and in terms of answering your, your question, I think it's the answer is we don't know um, clearly where we're going with the Shared Prosperity Fund, um, and until we see the detail of that, um, in, in terms of how much scope we're going to be allowed in Scotland to decide how to design the programmes and how to allocate the funding, um, it's very difficult to answer that question clearly. We want to be able to do exactly what you said, which is to look at the landscape look at our strategic objectives, look at what's happening locally, and design programmes that fit into that space. Um, but, as I say, until we see 
what we're going to be allowed to do, um, it's very difficult to answer that question. OK, and on a specific um, point that was made to us in discussions with Robin Smale, uh, uh, an academic, um, he uh, acknowledged that there may be a role for a, a kind of a sub-fund to deal with crisis or economic shock events, um, notwithstanding the Brexit itself. Um, are There are economic shocks that take place across the country on a routine basis. Um, is that something that you would consider or contemplate, or do you think that's more appropriately uh, dealt with in, in, in other parts of government? Well, I think it... it, it it depends exactly what you mean by that, because if you're to say, here's a given pot of money, and by the way, we want to set up a sub-fund for crisis, then the first thing immediately you're doing, obviously, is taking some money out of the overall pot, which makes the overall pot smaller, to put this money to the side to wait for the crisis. So you might decide that's a priority, or it may be that you'd rather have that money allocated now and driving forward the, the strategic... Um, uh, programs that you want to, to drive forward at this stage. So I think it's, it's not free money, if you like, that money has to come from somewhere to put into this, this sub-fund. Um, you're then looking at well, what sort of crisis you're talking about. I mean, if you're talking about something that's very local and affects a, a business or a group of businesses or a specific industry or part of an industry, then it, it, it may be that there's a case for an intervention there. And the Scottish Government clearly has intervened and in, in examples of it, 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 industrial interventions we've made over recent years to support businesses or industries to, to allow them to go forward and, and, and develop. Um, if it's a, a larger shock that like you're talking about another financial crisis or you're talking about something, um, who knows what the impact uh, of Brexit itself is going to be, as you, as you rightly mentioned, then you could be in a situation where whatever kind of sub-fund you've got is clearly dwarfed by the, the, the requirements of the of the crisis as such. So I think it's, um, it's an interesting idea. I'm not sure how much mileage there is in it when you start to pick away at, at some of those fundamental questions around about it, but it's certainly something we'll have on our agenda to consider. Okay, thanks. Gordon MacDonald. Thank you. I want to just continue this discussion about the UK Shared Prosperity Fund. If my understanding is correct, uh, since the announcement in May 2017 of um, the Shared Prosperity Fund, there has only been one meeting between UK government ministers and Scottish government ministers, if my understanding is correct from what you said. And I'm just wondering, is there an, a concern that the method of distribution, administration and evaluation of, of this fund might not be devolved to Scotland? Um, in, in terms of ministerial meetings, I don't know if you're referring to, I mean, I had one meeting with, with Lord Henley as a minister responsible, but it was a, a very broad general introductory meeting and, and didn't go into a lot of specifics on, on the fund, um, other than to raise our, our concerns about exactly what you just said. Um, in terms of official engagement, there has been very little, but I'll let David Anderson talk in a minute about the details of where that is up to, because I know things have started to move recently. I mentioned the UK government consultation, which we're expecting any time any time now, and we'll see where that goes. But in terms of your general point, yes, other than some words round about they will respect the devolution settlement, we don't have any specifics, so it's quite possible that um, an awful lot of the control round about what you can do with that fund, how large it is, where it can go, how it's managed, how it's audited, the time scales round about it, the, the, the methodologies for accessing it, um, who can bid for it, what the match funding is, all of those questions. And as far as we are concerned, there's no clarification, um, and therefore they, they could be controlled at a UK level. We've we, we nothing to say that that isn't the case, as far as I'm aware. Yeah. No. Um, he also touched upon the fact that this consultation is late. And given the whole delay in the system and that Scotland currently has a, a pot of money available to them in the current EU structural fund round of about 944 million euros for the 2014-2020 period, what would the economic impact be in Scotland if uh, there was to be a, a, a delay in the full implementation of this fund by the end of 2020? 900 and whatever it was, euros. Exactly. Yeah, right. um, yeah, exactly. I mean, it's, it's also significant. Um, if we fall off a cliff now, I mean, just to, 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 to clarify, um, but more than that, because we're obviously 
getting more benefit back for our, for our investment, clearly. But in terms of uh, where we're at, as we understand it just now, if there's a no-deal scenario, then the UK government has indicated there would be a Treasury guarantee there, so they would fund the programmes to the end of the, the 2020 period. Um, beyond that, as I say, we don't know the scale yet or the, 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 the numbers in about the Shared Prosperity Fund. So, uh, yes, it is a big unknown and it's a big concern, frankly. If I may, I'm just going to say, it's not just that cliff edge, it's that sense that stakeholders are already planning now for yeah. what comes next. Okay. So that point, as you ask about how we get that clarity, is, is a very live question in the minds of stakeholders because they're looking to say, well, how do I, can I continue these programs yeah. or do I have to make some uh, provision for them perhaps not being there? Yeah. Uh, and we've made that point to officials. And, and uh, officials are aware of that um, in other parts. And very clearly the view that they've said is that this thing, the Shared Prosperity Fund, uh, will be ready to go on the 1st of January 2021. Let's hope so. <laughs> one, one other question I was going to ask was, um, there's been suggestion that any new UK Shared Prosperity Fund um, will have the opportunity to look at um, different areas of the, the economy that they couldn't previously do under uh, EU rules. However, we heard in one of the evidence sessions on the 15th of May by Robin Smale, uh, and it was backed up of the European Institute of Public Administration and Professor Backler, that uh, with aspects of state aid and public procurement, we will, will most likely have to continue to follow the EU regulatory framework. So given that that could be the possibility, how much scope is there um, for introducing different programmes that we currently have? Certainly specifically on the state aid point, um, I think you're right, or the, the witnesses are, are correct as, in that sense, because the um, the expectation and the indication from the, the UK government is that the state aid rules would, would continue pretty much as they are for the foreseeable future, not least because if you're hoping to do a deal with the EU, then they're going to want to know that you're not um, doing things with state aid that are going to disrupt uh, normal trade. So... Um, the expectation is that, uh, that those would continue pretty much as they are, uh, which means that the scope for doing something, uh, there may be stuff around the margins, but at a significant level, we don't anticipate we're going to be able to tear up state aid and, 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 and operate as if it, those rules don't exist. I don't know if you want to add any more detail to, to where we are on, on state aid. No, and to the state aid point, as you make, is absolutely right, Minister. It's the that what is the flexibility going forward, and the rules and guidance are pretty very detailed when you get into um, what you can spend the money on and what the outcomes are targeted at within the EU guidance and legislation. So I think we would all hope that there is that flexibility, and the flexibility the Minister's talked about in response to earlier questions, is that flexibility to be able to write the programme that addresses the needs of Scotland's economy is the flexibility that would be sought uh, without perhaps prescribing to the nth degree uh, what we actually mean by that in terms of funding outcomes. There is always a balance and that sense of, you know, there's that balance between you prescribe to the nth degree and are very clear, or you just have a very open, and then there's something about, begin to question, is what is the, how do you define the value, and how do you define the audit trail to ensure you've actually got the value out of that additional money? Okay, thanks so much. Um, Follow-up from Dean Lockhart. Uh, thank you, Convener. It's a supplemental on uh, the question of government support for, for the economy because last week's programme for government announced a, a new export plan, a national export plan, with £20 million of support over the next three years. I wonder if the Minister could clarify which agency will deliver the national export plan and the form of uh, financial support that will be available under the plan? Oh, sure. off, off topic, but yeah. Um, the um, you're right. There's 20 million pounds there. That the, the support for um, peer to peer for 100, 100 businesses. There's support for 50 businesses to uh, um, to um, uh, enhance and develop their uh, per year to develop their export potential and encourage them to grow. Clearly, it's it's, it's a range of a 
part of a whole range of, of activities that are going on, and there'll be more meet around the, um, the, the export plan. It's something I'm working on at the moment with officials. I've got a trade board meeting next week to further develop that um, and uh, see that money. And specifically in terms of which agencies it will be, it will depend on, on what businesses we're talking about. Um, but um, how that £20 million is going to get spent in total, because the... The examples I've given, there are only, I think, about two or three million of it, so the, the rest of it, how exactly it's going to get spent, will be a consequence of the, the, the detail around about the export plan that will be um, getting unveiled, we said, in the, the spring of next year, but we're working hard okay. on that at the moment. Th there's much more to it than, than just those specific interventions. There's an awful lot of work going on round about um, where uh, trends and exports have been by sector, what kinds of companies offer the most potential to grow exports what sectors and therefore what geographies we should focus on and therefore where we should focus resources to maximise Scotland's export potential going forward. So that's quite a significant piece of work and I say that will see um, the light of day sometime in the early part of next mm. year. And has it been decided which agency, which government agency will deliver and oversee, implement the, the National Export Plan? Well, clearly all, all agencies are involved. I mean, SDI is at the forefront of that because they're the agency that's, that's working internationally. Um, but other agencies have got a role there, be that to uh, encourage businesses to export, which is something that Highlands and Islands Enterprise and, um, and Scottish Enterprise do at the moment through their account management processes, engage with businesses and have that discussion about are you exporting, what can we do to help you export more? Um, and then those businesses are, 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 are fed up, if you like, to uh, they brought the attention of SDI um, to uh, be, be on trade missions, be on putting them in touch with uh, Global Scots or the new trade envoys or or the, the, the investment and innovation hubs internationally um, and the whole range of support that's there to link those businesses up with opportunities in their sectors globally. So in answer to the question, it's SDI that's at the, the forefront of that, but all the other agencies have got a role to support and work with businesses to maximise their export potential. Thank you. Um, if there are no further questions from committee members, um, I'd like to thank the Minister and David Anderson for coming in today. And uh, we'll now uh, move into private session. Thank you.